Father, we love you this morning. We give you praise and glory. Father, if your presence is in it, what's the use? Your word declares unless you build the house and then it's labors, labor in vain. Father, we don't want religion. We don't want legalism. We want your presence. We want your Torah. We want your word. We want your teaching, your instructions. And as we grow and become the men and women that you have called us to be, let that always be our heart cry, that we long and desire more of you and less of everything around us, less of our world, less of us. Father, we love you this morning. You're so worthy of praise. Can we just say that this morning? Can we lift up our hands this morning? Just say, Father, I need more of you. More of you and less of me. Remove my ideologies, my thoughts, my thinking of the way things should go, Father. We just, we just rest in being led and guided by your Ruach HaKadosh, your Holy Spirit, the seal of approval for those who call upon Yeshua. Lord, we love you this morning. We worship you in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. We praise God, man. Y'all give the Lord a, a, a clap offer. Come on. Come on. Come on. Now, y'all have done the Cowboys a lot better service, man, than that. Come on. God's worthy of it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead and be seated if you can. Uh, next, or next, I want to say next gen. Kids Nation, right? We're going to call them Kids Nation still. Uh, you guys are dismissed. Teachers, if you need to go, go. Uh, only kids get to leave, okay? Adults, you have to stay here and listen to me, okay? Love y'all. Good to see you guys. God bless you. Hey, I don't usually promote a book. Uh, from the platform, I don't think it's like, but there's one I do want to promote to you guys. Um, some of y'all guys might know this guy. It, there's a book out there in our, uh, what we call like a little bookstore. And guys, that's for you, okay? Because we know that sometimes we forget like, oh, I got to get that or oh, I need this. Or sometimes you wonder where I get my information from. There's some stuff out there that you guys are more than welcome to. Um, and you can, uh, it, we're not like trying to make profit out here, amen? We're, we're, we just reimburse what we, what we spent to get that stuff out there. So I want to encourage you guys, if you haven't looked at there, my testimony's in there. If you didn't know it, I have a book. It's called Transformed. That's my book. Uh, that's my life. You can read it. If you're smarter than me, you'll read it in 10 minutes. I'm just saying, okay? Um, not real deep theologically, okay? But it is my story. Um, my wife and I is really not just my story, but it's, it's our testimony of what the, what the Father's done. But I do want to promote a book here today. I'm not being paid for this. YouTube, my name's Mike, and I'm not being... Um, Paid by this guy, okay. But as I was studying uh, Sabbath, I came across this, this guy, and some of y'all are probably familiar with him. His name's David Wilbur. Um, this guy don't look like much on TV. I mean, if you all see, ever see him, he, he doesn't. He's just like a, like, he's just a drip of water. I mean, he's little, okay. But man, probably some of the best teaching on Sabbath right here. Uh, that I've uh, that I've ever read. It, it aligns with what I've always believed. Have y'all ever done that before? Like you know something, right? And then you read someone else. It's like, that's what I've been trying to say. Man, this guy is one of them guys. Okay, I just want to encourage you. Go ahead and read him. Check a lot. Check, uh, 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 he's, he's, man, this is spot on uh, with some of the teaching. So a guy named, it's called Remember the Sabbath. Uh, and I got this off Amazon. I don't know what I paid for. I can't remember what I paid for, but it wasn't very expensive. David Wilbur. Uh, this guy is an apologetics. If you don't know what that means, I mean, he likes to study, right? He's kind of, uh, that's my vein. I love apologetics. I love the teaching. Anyway, I brought that up there just to show you guys. So I want to get right into it. I have, you know, sometimes you would hope that your team, your leaders would have some faith in you. And so they've seen the message and it's 15 pages long. And they said, I wouldn't finish today. I am going to try to finish today. <laughs> right. So without any further ado, we're going to go into what I feel like is really the last part of this, not of Akkad, the series, but of this section of it where we've looked at the Sabbath and looking at to what the Sabbath is, uh, why we as followers, as Christians, should uh, be following the Sabbath. And I, I, I said this last Sunday, and I'm going to say it again, uh, what this topic is going to be. Is I want to dive into what the New Testament says about the Sabbath. I think a lot of us, that if we study this stuff, we know most of us in the room or online, if you're online, we want to welcome you, by the way. Guys, we have a, our online is growing. Our, we have a lot of people today that are watching us online because of the flu. We know there's a lot of them uh, that are watching today. And so y'all just keep our, our, our family uh, that are a lot of people out there. Doing. But um, 
I don't know what I have that to do with anything, but so this week we want to talk about what the New Testament says about the Torah. And what I was going to go with, many of us know what the Old Testament says. Uh, we know, we can quote, you know, say, uh, so, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, Exodus, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 23, uh, or Exodus 23, Genesis 23, I'm so confused right now, praise the Lord. When you get off, it just happens, okay? Uh, but we, we know what the Bible says, we know what Exodus 20 says, that we're going to keep the commandment, make it holy. Um, and we, we're going to, I showed a couple of scriptures last week that were just so powerful, how the Sabbath, man, it's a testimony of us as believers, right? That God says this will be an everlasting, a propitial covenant for those who follow him, right? And uh, we kind of uh, dealt with that. But today, what we don't talk a lot about is what does the New Testament have to say? And when we, when we see that there's not a commandment maybe necessarily mentioned within the New Testament, Typical Christianity will say, well, see, we don't got to follow it because it wasn't repeated within the New Testament. And that is so far from the truth. Because here's the thing, man, you got to remember that in the New Testament, these are Torah observant Gentiles and Jewish people. We're going we're to talk about that this morning, right? This is powerful. They're Torah observant. They're Gentiles and Jews coming together in Messiah. And that's what really what the New Testament is about. And I want to I clarify something real quick, not even in the notes. But here's what I want to clarify. When you see passages within the New Testament that says, like Messiah is saying, you have seen it or you have heard it or you have read, he is referring to the Torah. He's referring to the Tanakh, the, the prophets, the New Testament or the Old Testament. He's not referring to the New Testament. Let me, let me just kind of shatter some, some, some false ideology, right? The New Testament did not exist when Messiah did. Okay, let's just get that in the clear. And when you understand this, this will help you understand why we teach certain things that you don't find within the New Testament, because it's not mentioned. But just because it's not mentioned, we're going to go into that, doesn't mean that it's not valid anymore. So wrapping up this portion of the Akkad series, we're going to move on into this and really deal with this New Testament. We're going to deal, I'm going to show you some stuff, man, that most of y'all just like, like you may have seen it, but boom, like, like me, okay? I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. It takes me a couple of times, all right, to see something. And over the past couple of weeks, we've looked at, one, why you and I are obligated to keep the Shabbat, the Sabbath. We are obligated. Look to your neighbor. You can point at him or her if you'd like, especially if they're your spouse, and say, you're obligated. You're obligated. You don't get out of this obligation because you're a Christian. Matter of fact, truth be known, you're obligated. You'll get that on the way home, okay? You're, you're obligated to do this. You don't have the option, as we talked about in the very first, go back a couple of weeks in our message series where we dealt with the sins of commission and the sins of omission. See, omission mean, commission means you didn't know. Like, like when, if you come to Epic Life and you've been here for a few weeks or months or whatever, and you're like, well, I didn't know we're supposed to do the Sabbath, and, and, and you haven't been following the Sabbath, you haven't been honoring the Sabbath, right? That's a sin of commission. You didn't know. You didn't set out to break God's command. You weren't setting out to like, God, I'm better than you type deal, right? You weren't trying to be pious or, or proudful or arrogant or even be a, a lawless person. You just didn't know. But remember, once you come to the knowledge of truth and you come to the knowledge of what his word says, you're now obligated. And that obligation, man, when you decide, you know what, forget that, I still don't agree with you. That's fine. You don't have to agree with Pastor Mike, okay? I know I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but here's the thing. You better agree with this. And I'm speaking to those who believe, who are followers of Mashiach, because this is the truth. And when you understand that now, and you thumb up to that and say, you know what, I'm not going to do it, that's a sin of omission. And you are held liable to that. And the Bible says that when we do that, it's a rebellious spirit that sits down inside us. And the Bible says the rebellion is as what? The sin of divination or witchcraft. And so now we, 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 we are obligated as followers of Jesus to follow all of his commands. And we've talked about that time and time again. And so I don't want to go into too much more of that. Now, last week we looked at how the church has come to place to honor Sunday or the, what we call the first day of the week above the Sabbath. Now, I want to start this morning, even though I promise you that I'm going to talk into the uh, New Testament. I know this is crazy. I'm going to start actually in the Old Testament. I know. I know I'm confusing you. It's okay. I'm confused too when God shows this stuff to me, all right? So let's look at real quick, though. I just want to go through it real quick. I want you to open your Bibles. Hopefully, you brought your Bibles or your iPhones or if you have iPhones. If you have real phones, Androids, go ahead and open up your... 
Okay, they don't sponsor me either, okay? But, but Isaiah chapter 56, this should be part of your arsenal as a believer when we start do- talking about the Sabbath. Matter of fact, you as a family, this should write men that are leading their family, this should be a go-to passage that you should teach to your children. Isaiah 56, beginning in verse 1, let's look at what it says. Thus says Adonai, preserve justice, do righteousness. Now here, watch this. For my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this. Now, he's, he's, there's a break in it. There's two thoughts happening, right? The first thought is, watch this, church, it's prophetic. In other words, God, through the, uh, through the prophet Isaiah, God is prophesying of what's fixing to happen. He's talking about Jesus. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But then he changes, and he goes, blessed is the one who does this. The son of man who takes hold of it. Who takes hold of what? Who does what? Keep reading. Who keeps from profaning the Shabbat and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Notice there's two commands there, right? He says, man, you are going to be what? Blessed. Blessed is the one that takes a hold of this and keeps profaning the Sabbath. And what's the other one? Keeps his hand from doing any evil. Right? Powerful, right? Goes on. Do not let a son of a foreigner. Now, last week we talked, was it last week or the week before, we talked about foreigners, right? Remember we talked about those that came out of Egypt, right? And it wasn't just Jewish people that came out of Egypt, right? It were foreigners. And we remember by the definition in Hebrew of what foreigners means, it means what? It means foreign people. It means people that were not tied to Judaism. They weren't Jewish by descendants. They weren't descendants of them. They were from everywhere else. Notice what he says in the scripture. You can't make this stuff up, guys. Do not let a son of a foreigner who has what? joined himself. Remember, we talked about that. How do you become part of Israel? You join yourself with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? Have we done that as believers, as followers of Christ? Have we joined ourselves with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yes. Amen. If you said no, you're wrong. Okay? I'm just like, everybody around you is telling you yes. Okay? Listen to them. Peer pressure. Let's go. Now, why? This is powerful, right? So you've joined yourself. We have joined ourselves to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Adonai, to himself, Adonai say. So he's saying, like, don't let, us, don't let someone that's a foreigner that's following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, say that we're excluded, right? Adonai will surely exclude me. This is what they're saying. This is what a foreigner is saying. Have you ever said this? Adonai will surely exclude me from his people. I'm not Jewish. I don't have to follow that. Okay, that's what I thought. Nor, this is powerful, watch the word picture he gives to us. Nor let the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. Now, if you don't study scripture, that might be like foreign. You're like, what the heck, is he, what's a eunuch got to do with this? Now, if you know what a eunuch is, go home, look it up. Okay, I'm not going to talk about the eunuch today, okay? That's right, right? Amen. Amen. We're not going to deal with the eunuchs today. But if you don't know what one is, go home and study it, all right? If you're young in here and you don't know, ask your mom and daddy, okay? Because they'll, they'll explain it to you, all right? But in the nation of Israel or during the time in the wilderness, if you were a eunuch and you couldn't produce children, guess where you had to reside? Somebody said it. I don't know who said it, but I heard it. That's right. That's right. Steve said it. You had, to stand, you, had to, you had to reside outside the camp. And this is what he's telling them, right? That they're outside. They can't even come in. Why? Because they can't produce. They're not going to let the lineage of Israel continue, right? They can't do it because they're, they're eunuchs. They're not, they're not able to. Now watch. This is so powerful. They're, they're supposed to be called to the outside. But look, he says, nor let the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. Well, what does that mean? Ask your mom and daddy, okay? I don't, I don't have time to draw pictures this morning, okay? A dry tree, eunuch, can't produce. They're dry. Okay, we're going on. Now watch, verse 4. For thus says Adonai. This is what the Lord's going to say to those two, the foreigner and the eunuch. Watch what he tells them. To the eunuchs who keep my Shabbat, who choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant. Right? Remember we talked about last week, right? That keeping the Sabbath is evidence of God's covenant, right? In the heart of the man, right? We know that out of Exodus. I will give to them in my house, within my walls, a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be covered. Now hold that scripture right there for a minute, uh, Sam. This is powerful. Now it's really easy to start reading and go say, hey, he's just talking about the eunuchs. He's not talking about foreigners. He's not talking about Gentile people, right? He's talking about the eunuch. Yeah, he is. But look at what he says. For the eunuch that keeps his Sabbath, those that were outside 
Israel, right, that were outside the camp, what's he going to do? You see this? Look at the blessing. He's going to make them greater. Give them a greater name than sons and daughters, than the original. Are we grafted in? Right, we're grafted into the original. Come on, somebody. Come on, don't miss this. You're going to miss it this morning. Don't, don't fall asleep on me. A memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Now watch this, verse 6. Powerful. Here it comes. You ready? Everybody say also. also. What's that mean? Also. It means someone else is getting involved in this, isn't it? The foreigners who join themselves to Adonai. Are you joined to Adonai? Amen. Come on, somebody. To minister to him. Do you worship him? Yes. You're ministering to him. Amen. And to love the name of Adonai. Do you love the Lord? Yes. Come on. Some of y'all do. Amen. And to be his. Are you serving the Adonai? Yes. Come on, somebody. Look, I didn't write this stuff. I'm just telling you what it says. All right. Pretty plain. Verse 7. These I will bring to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable. In other words, if you don't have a relationship with Adonai, what happens to your prayers? They fall, right? But they won't because we're believers, right? God hears our prayer, doesn't he? He listens. He hears us. Why? Because we have a relationship with him. And let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifice will be accepted on my altar. This is powerful. You understand what this is referencing to? Remember when we talked about that very first verse? Can you pop up that very first verse for me, Sam? I want you guys to see this again. Preserve justice, do righteousness. Why? For my salvation is about to come. And my righteousness is to be revealed. Whose name is salvation, people? Yeshua, Jesus, that's right. Right? His salvation is coming, right? This is prophetic. And then go back to that last verse that we just had, that verse 5, I think it was, or verse 7, yeah. For my house will be called a house of prayer. Go back to the one right before it. These will I bring to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifice will be accepted on my altar. You see, you, when you receive Messiah, and not only receive Messiah, but you do not profane God's Sabbath, this is about salvation. This is about salvation. He said, I'm going to bring you in. Now, a lot of people can get misunderstood and say, well, does that mean just by practicing the Sabbath, I'm saved? No, we know that's garbage, right? We know that's not truth. What we're saying is that if you are a believer in Messiah, if you've repented of sin, if you receive Jesus, right, the old terminology, if you receive Jesus as your Lord, your Adonai, you're in. And because you're in, we honor the Sabbath. Why? Because, man, there's a reward for us doing. We, man, the devil's a liar, Amen. And he wants to steal from God. He, look, we've already talked about Satan cannot create. He only perverts. He takes something that's really good that God wants to do, especially to God's people because he's so jealous, right? You know why he's jealous? He will never, ever be redeemed. Think about that for a moment. The enemy will never redeem. He has fallen forever. And now what does he do? He tries to rob the blessing from you. How does he do it? Let's worship on Sunday. You miss out on the blessing that God has when we don't have the understanding of what Sabbath is really all about. And I want to hit this because but as we get ready to go in, you need to see what the promise is of the Father, right? Uh, the last verse says, for my house will be called a house of prayer. For what? All nations, right? I will gather others. There it goes. All nations. Verse 8, Elohim, Elohim, who gathers the dispersed of Israel, declares, I will gather still others to him. To those already gathered. Guess who those are? The people that haven't come in yet. That's you. That's me. It's the Gentiles. It's even the Jews who have rejected Messiah, right? He's going to gather them in. There's still others coming. My point is, man, this is so prophetic, man, in the message, right? This word um, son or of a foreigner, I mean, we're talking some really cool language. I'm going to go on past that. Let me get through that because this is, there's, there is a lot to see. See, we have to remember that it's Satan that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It comes, he comes to rob, and he does it right in front of us every week. Most of us don't even realize it. When we do not honor the Sabbath, you're allowing the enemy to rob you. I need to say that again. When you are not honoring the Sabbath, you're allowing the enemy. You understand that? Because you're believing a lie, you're believing deception to rob your family. To rob your family of a blessing that God wants to bless your family. Now, you may say, well, what about Joe, and what about Susie down there down the street? And don't worry about them, right? See, you're, you're accountable to the knowledge and the wisdom that you receive. 
You don't know what you don't know. But once you know it, you're accountable to it. So you're welcome. If this is your first time today, you're welcome. Right? Like, I didn't know that. You're welcome. You know now. Right? Come on, somebody. There are pastors around here in our communities and that are preaching. And I know I'm going to mention a couple of them, and I need to. They need to be called out because of some of the things that they've said. I'm going to talk out uh, just real quick. I mean, some, and you can write me an email, okay? Pastor Greg Lockie. Some of y'all like him. Deliverance pastor. Oh, he delivers. Oh, you know. But he also has a message out there, man, said that the Sabbath day, watch this, his words, not mine, and I quote, Sabbath keeping is straight from the pits of hell and of demonic. Now, wait a second here. If a preacher is decreeing that to thousands of people that he teaches to, what's that say about Messiah who kept Sabbath? That Messiah kept demonic theology? Come on, people. Who created the Sabbath? <laughs> but yet Greg Lockie says, Sabbath keeping is straight from the pits of hell and is demonic. Did the disciples keep Sabbath? Did, did Yeshua keep Sabbath? Are they practicing doctrines of demons? Of course not. And we've got some good teachers out there that are teaching it, but they'll skirt around the day. Right? There's a couple pastors that I like. I mean, I, I, I've got one pastor that, that I've talked to you guys about. I, I like uh, uh, Pastor Robert Moore. Great guy. Great teacher in a lot of things. But if you ever watch his message on Sabbath, he tells you to keep the Sabbath, but you know what he does, doesn't do? Tell you what day it is. Don't have that boldness. Why? Well, I mean, he's running a pretty large congregation. That could cause some heat. I mean, if it caused the heat in a little church like ours, imagine what it would do in a church that's larger than that. Does that mean everything that he teaches is false? No. Right? And I know you can't blanket someone by one teaching, right? I know we can't do that. But we have to be careful what we're hearing with our ears, right? He who has ears, let him hear what the Torah, what God's word says, his instruction, right? We got to be careful of this. We talked about this last week of how do we join ourselves to Adonai. We hit on this last week, understanding that those who are foreigners are, the, uh, are this term, joined to Adonai, happens when we call on him through Messiah, Yeshua. That's when we call on him. But you and I, have to. we declare our allegiance to Yeshua. We repent of our sins. We become attached to the Father. And we ain't got time to go back into grafted in the vine and understanding all of that. Most of you all know this. If you're online and you're watching, you probably know this as well. We know that Yeshua is Adonai. He is the Lord. And when we attach ourselves to him, we make ourselves obligated to obey all of his commands. It's not a buffet, church. We don't get to pick and choose. Well, I like the sweets and I don't like the vegetables. Sorry. You got to have the veggies if you're going to get the dessert, right? Some of y'all still want, veg or want the fruit, right? Amen. I'm going to get done, I promise you. And we see two things in the book of Isaiah, two things that we need to note as we move forward. Number one, Sabbath is for anyone who joins himself or herself to Adonai. That's powerful. You need to write that down. Sabbath is for anyone who joins himself or herself to Adonai. Number two, there is also the prophetic message about the coming of Messiah right there in salvation and righteousness. No other righteousness, right? But in him. Complete righteousness. We know that righteousness means to be in right standing, right? To be in right standing with God. Well, how do we get in right standing? Because of Messiah and what he did. We'll talk about that more here a little bit later. Why is all of this important? Well, if Messiah was going to do away with the Sabbath, I want you to catch this. As we move into the New Testament, as Mes if Messiah was going to do away with the Sabbath as many proclaimed, then why are they both mentioned in this passage as prophecy of the coming Messiah? Think about that. Isaiah 56, man, is a prophecy, verse 1, about the coming of salvation, the coming of Yeshua righteousness then why does it follow in with what the sabbath and not to defame it or profane it pardon me now let's get into the new testament and see whoo -hoo, what we can dig up i love man i'm telling you i told the guys this morning i can't wait to you know this is such a great message um and and you gotta understand something when i preach man and i teach i just i get a little kind of like i hate to use the word but a little giddy because i love god's word and when truth becomes out and then you're able to like help people grab a hold of this man and and like watching one of the one of the greatest rewards that i receive as a pastor is watching you right i love watching you except for when you're falling asleep on me okay i don't i don't i don't but what i love man is like watching the light bulbs because up here you can see the revelation hitting 
You can see what it's like. It's clicking, it's clicking, it's clicking. And that is the reward, I think, of any pastor who's speaking truth. And, and so it's, it's wonderful. So as we move forward into this, there's some things that we need to understand when looking at the commands of Yahovah and the New Testament is this. Just because, I want you to write this down. It's very important. Just because, it may be even in your worship guides. I think I put it in there. Just because the New Testament does not repeat or speak on a command does not mean we are no longer obligated to that command. I want to say it this way. Just because Jesus did not say you must do blank does not remove our obligation to obey that command. Do you all understand? Amen. Right? There's a lot of that. And the reason for that is, as we move forward, you need to keep a couple of things in mind. Number one, primarily in the New Testament, right? Who is Messiah speaking to? Hebrews. Y'all heard that, right? Hebrews. Not a lot of Gentiles. There were Gentiles around him. But remember what he said. I didn't come but for the lost sheep of Israel. So he's speaking to people that he knew would be doing a couple of things. Number one, they were obeying the Ten Commandments. They were obeying the Torah. You have to understand that when you start looking at New Testament Scripture. Right? Now, the other thing is, there are a lot of things that are mentioned within the New Testament that are mentioned in the Old Testament that we're still liable today to do. Right? A lot of them. We'll go into those here in a little bit. But I want to read this quote to you. This is from The Sabbath, Entering God's Rest by Barry and Steffi, uh, Steffi Rubin. To conclude that because the New Testament doesn't specifically repeat a commandment means that it was done away with is spuriously reasoning. Yeshua observed Sabbath every week. We're going to show that in a minute. Its observance was assumed. Additionally, there are many laws of the Torah that are not restated by the Messiah. For example, the law of incest. No one would conclude that because this wasn't restated, it is therefore now acceptable to practice the sexual perversion. No, the fact that the New Testament does not specifically restate the fourth commandment does not mean it therefore became inc inconsequential. Amen? Amen? There are a lot of things within the Torah and the prophets that we should be following, and even though it's not mentioned within the New Testament or by Paul or by Yeshua himself, does not mean that we're, we're no longer obligated to obey him. That doesn't even make sense. That doesn't even make sense. You have to remember who Messiah is teaching, who Messiah is speaking to, right? It was Paul that was sent out, and we're going to talk a little bit about Paul as well. So, for instance, also in the New Testament, doesn't speak about cross-dressing as well, right? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not a fan of it. Okay? So don't come in here cross-dressing. I don't know what that was. Praise the Lord. Okay. We got real quiet. Nobody said amen to that. I don't understand. Praise God. Right? Look. Is this thing on? Praise God. All right. But, but because it doesn't mention in the New Testament, right, does that mean that cross-dressing is okay? Obviously not. But here's the thing. There's one particular characteristic that, that I have found as a pastor, counselor, that you guys probably would agree with, that all human beings have in common since the dawn of mankind. All of us have this, this similarity. And it's this. In, in respect, we, we aren't any different really from even the biblical characters. We see it in a lot of our biblical characters. Y'all know what that characteristic is? I'm talking about the human tendency to always um, in, or insistently and, may I say, sneakily, Sneaky, be on the lookout for a darn loophole. We're always wanting to find the loophole, right? When you get caught in something like, yeah, but, right? I mean, we're, we're the experts in the yeah, buts. Yeah, but, officer, I know the speed limit was 70 miles an hour, but I needed to get to church. I mean, the speed limit was 50 miles an hour, I was trying to get to church, right? So, yeah, but, we're always trying to find that loophole. There wasn't a sign. Yeah, there was 10 miles back, you just didn't see it, right? Put into simple terms, we're always trying to find a safe way to break rules minus reaping any negative consequences. We want to break the rule, but we don't want the consequence that comes with it, right? We all parents, parents y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Little Johnny, little Susie, they do it all the time, right? They always try to break those little rules, and I got a list of them, man, for Brenton. You know, you know Brent, why were you doing that? I wasn't doing that. Yes, you were. I just think you know I wasn't Papa. <laughs> but Papa, and he fills in the blank. We hear things like Yeshua came not to abolish the law, and that includes the Sabbath. And we built testimony and sermons and messages and, 
And we preach on this thing all the time because we're trying to find a loophole. But is that what Yeshua really said? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's look into the New Testament and let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Most of you uh, know this verse. Um, and if you don't know it, you're going to know it today. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. It says, do not think... That's a good way for Messiah to start something out, right? Now remember, Matthew 5, anybody want to know, remember what Matthew 5 is all about? It's, the, it's, it's, his, big, it's his big appearance. It's, it's like if there was going to be a message, right, that pastor was going to preach, the, the message to end all messages, right, that's what Messiah is doing right here. This is his Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes and all of that stuff. He's coming out, and watch what he says in verse 5, or seven, verse 17 of chapter 5. Do not think that I came to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Now, like in the English language, right, there are a lot of words that sometimes mean the same thing. And, and I was trying to think of a whole list of them, but I was getting confused by trying to write them. And I was like, I'm not going to do it because then I'm going to say the wrong word that meant the other word. And I don't want to do that. Right. But we've all been there. Right. Teachers like like I, I don't know, give me a word. Give me one of those words that it's it's it sounds the same, but spelled differently. Word. Huh? Word. word. Work. Meat. Too. Meat. Meat is a great one. Meat. Like, are we meeting up or are we eating meat? Right? Were. Were. Were what? Were. You were this or you, I don't, don't even give me the R of it. I don't know, okay? See there, it gets confusing. We do the same thing. When you don't know what a word is, our mind, what it automatically does is assume that a word means something else other than what its true meaning is. But we have to understand, I have the, I have the, the blessing that I get to sit down and this is what I do. This is what I do for a living. I study, and I look at the words, and I listen to other commentaries, and I read, and I, 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 I find original meaning. And I know by generally just reading the Bible, this, this can go by you. But even, listen to me, even someone who doesn't have a degree in whatever can look at that passage and look. There's no way that Jesus is giving you two negatives, a double negative, right? Abolish and fulfill, meaning the same thing. But that's what people have come to believe, haven't they? Well, Jesus came and abolished the law. No, he didn't. Well, he fulfilled it. Yes, he did. Isn't that the same? No. When you understand context. And when you understand what the words mean. So I want to give you some, a little bit of that. Let's go ahead and finish reading it first. Amen, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away. Watch this. Not the smallest letter or theory. These are the, the dots of the Hebrew language. Shall never pass away from the Torah until what? All things come to pass. Now, let me, let me say something. Have we, is everything passed away yet? No. Well, there is something. We all got missed, okay? I'm just telling you, all right? We lost something. Nothing, not everything has passed away. Is the new kingdom here yet? Is the new Jerusalem here yet? Has Messiah returned yet? No. So therefore, just based upon that argument and that argument alone, we can say that nothing's passed away yet. We're just halfway through, praise God. Therefore, whoever breaks one... Here's another one. Oh, my goodness. This is the same conversation. Whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others the same. You need to hear this. Right? Greg Locke needs to hear this. Whoever teaches others the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's heavy weight for a pastor. That's heavy weight for a teacher, isn't it? So if we're teaching these things that have been passed away, the Bible states, Jesus himself said they'll be least in the kingdom of God. You want to be blessed? But whoever keeps and teaches them, not just teaches them, come on church, but whoever keeps and teaches them, this one shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Torah scholars, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you understand what he's... Now, man, I can go into theology here so much. Look, what were the Pharisees really good at keeping? No. Their law. Their Torah. Remember? And Messiah's, Messiah's calling them out. So what's that mean for us? We should be Torah keepers. His Torah. His commandments. Not the Pharisees. Not the scholars. Not the leaders. Not all the, what you know, and we'll talk, I mean, think about it. I read somewhere this week that like for, for the Sabbath, they have like 56 in the, in the Talmud. They have over 56 rules regarding just the Sabbath. Just the Sabbath. Like, God says in the Sabbath, don't work, cease from working, um, gather together. We're going to talk about this at the end of the message. Gather together, that's the Sabbath, right? Keep it holy, right? Pharisee scholars come around and say, well, we're going to make 56 laws on, on, on how to do that. 
And what they did is they took God's commandment, threw it out the door, and they honored their rules and their laws above everything. This is what Messiah is saying. Now watch. The word abolish in the Greek is kataleo, and it means to put down, to destroy, to overthrow, right? To throw down. It means to get rid of. Throw it down. Get rid of. Kick it. He says, I didn't come to do that. I didn't come to destroy it. I didn't come to overthrow it. Right? I didn't come to put it away. I didn't come to put it down. Right? But the word fulfill, watch this. The word fulfill means this. It's expectate. Or so let's go back to there. It's a, a palero. And it means to meet or satisfy. Expectation. To complete one's mission. What was his mission? What did he have to complete? What was the expectation that was needed? Penalty. Because we were lawbreakers. There's a death sentence. His mission? Pay the debt for us. He paid our debt so we don't have to. When we stand before the Father at the day of judgment, He will not see our lawlessness. But he will see the penalty has been... Well, he'll see our lawlessness, but he'll see the penalty, right? In Messiah. This is what it's about, church. This is what Messiah did for us. He came to fulfill it. He came to show us, look, I'm going to pay the debt to satisfy the needs, to fulfill the covenant. Now, in the English, real quick, uh, abolish means to do, to do away with, holy, to annul. Used chiefly of laws, customs, institutions, and traditions. Right? To abolish. Or that's, to, that's the word fulfill. And then, I think that's right. Yes. To, uh, no, oh, this is uh, abolish as well. Uh, it means to destroy completely. Right? Now we know, anybody who knows this Bible knows that's not true. To destroy completely? Wait a second. Think about this. Do we, do, do we have a problem with the first commandment? Anybody? I mean, think about think from a Christian perspective. Does anybody have a problem with putting God first? Obviously not, right? Now we, I know we've talked about this a lot. What about murder? Anybody got a problem with murder in here? Right? Well, hopefully all of us have a problem with murder, right? Amen? <laughs> right? But we don't have a problem with the commandment, thou shalt not murder, do we? So why is number four? Because remember what I told you. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to rob you of the blessing that God has given to you because you honor the Sabbath. You know, there's so much about the Sabbath in, in Scripture. It just blows my mind. Now, it's very important to note that Matthew 5 and the Sermon on the Mount is all about bringing out the Torah fullest and proper application. This is what he came for. He came to lay down the Pharisees and say, dude, you got it wrong. If you read the, when you read it again, your, your whole, your, your, your brain's going to explode. Because when you look at it now, you're going to see this. Because maybe you've never looked at it from this perspective. But that's the whole, uh, the whole understanding of chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. If Messiah come in and said, these guys are teaching you wrong, I'm going to tell you how to do it right. Powerful. Powerful. Remember, Yeshua is not doing away with the Torah, but he came to fulfill it. This word fulfill also brings, uh, means to bring out its full expression. It's full meaning. Yeshua shows us what it means to obey the Torah. Not to do away with it. Remember the Pharisees had insulated the Torah with traditions and rules so as not to break the Torah. They had good intentions, right? But what happened is they began to uphold the traditions and the legalism above what the Word said. And what we're trying to do as, as believers now is to bring it back. Right? Now, Let's go on. Let's move through this. I want to show you how he corrects this whole idea of Messiah coming to show us the true picture. Right? Great example is the scripture you all have talked about before. Mark chapter 7, 6 through 9. And it says, And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites. He's not talking about you guys, okay? He's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes, right? Rightly did he prophesy as it is written, The people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In other words, they, they went out through the detail. They, they made themselves look righteous by obedience to their traditions and their laws, right? Making themselves look a little bit more pious and a little bit better than everybody else, right? But what does he say? Their heart, the heart issue was far from them. And in vain they worship me, teaching, get this, this is, this, watch what he says. You think this is Pastor Mike? This ain't Pastor Mike. Come on now. In vain they worship me. What? Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. They were taking God's commandments and God's doctrines, setting aside, and they're saying, all right, this is what the doctrine is going to be now. It's going to be the, our commandments, what we tell you to do. 
That's why they became so pious. And, and Jesus said, you're, you're, you're whitewashed tombs. Outside you look all good, but inside you're dead. Filled with dead man's bones is what it says. Right? What's he telling them? They, they do all the works. They look good, but man, their heart was so far from the Messiah, from the Father. Verse 8, having left behind, what? Having left behind the commandment of God. Now go back one verse, please. I want to repeat it. Verse 7, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. This is Jesus speaking. Verse 8, having left behind God's commandments. You hold on to the traditions of men. Man, this, is, this should be the aha moment y'all been looking for, right? Some of y'all been struggling like, well, I don't understand. Well, I understand. Look at what they've been teaching. And this is how we got to the place we are today. Are there still traditions that we're upholding above God's commandments today? Absolutely. And this is the fight of the church. This is the fight of pastors and rabbis who are coming together saying, no, we've got to go back to what the truth says. Verse 9 says, he was also telling them, you set aside the commands of God in order that you may validate your own traditions. What did Jesus come for? He came for the same thing. He does this. And, and what I love about Paul, what's so cool about Paul, Paul does the exact same thing with Messiah, that Messiah is doing. Right? He comes back in the whole book of Galatians. We've been talking about this, right? He comes back to say, hey, man, these guys have come in amongst you, and they're teaching false teachings to you, telling you've got to be circumcised, right, of the flesh and, and not of the heart, not of the spirit. Powerful, Right? It's the same battle that we battle even today. Now, we don't call them Pharisees and we don't call them scribes, right? We call them whatever their church doctrine's name is, right? I don't want to call them out. There's a whole mess of them. There's 5,500 of them. Figure it out. Pick one, right? We call them that, that, whatever that religion is, whatever that tradition is. Well, this is why we do that. This is why we do that. This, you can go on the Southern Baptist website and look under statements of faith. You can look. It's public knowledge, guys. And their statement of faith is, we meet on Sunday because that's the Lord's day. But not one passage of Scripture that can, that, can, that can testify to it. Traditions of men. Whoo! I get a little fired up about stuff like this, praise God. I love it. Thank you all. i got to find out where I'm at now, praise the Lord. All right, here we go. <laughs> praise God. I don't want us to just skip over this. passage supports the commandments. Why? Because if Yeshua wanted to do away with the Torah, this would be the place that Jesus would, would, would do away with the, with, with the Sabbath day. This would be the passage right here that, that Messiah could say, all right, guys, you're right. You've kind of been doing things, but now we're gonna, this is the way we're going to be doing it. Right? We're going to do away with Sabbath, all the murder stuff, all them ten things. Right? We can get away with it from right here because I'm here. I'm going to die on the cross. All this is mute. If there was ever a place that Messiah could have, that we could have changed everything, it would have been in this passage of Mark. Powerful, guys. Think about this for a moment, right? It's powerful. Woo! Amen. But what does he do? He doesn't do away with it. He upholds it, rebuking or correcting the Pharisees and their traditions above God's commandments. And we see this happening today. But that doesn't excuse us. None of us. Well, my daddy did this, and my preacher said this, and I was baptized there, and I went to youth camp, and this is what I... Man, that stuff's mute. It's mute now. Don't let the enemy rob you of what God wants to do to you. Yeshua honored the Sabbath, and he came to demonstrate how to live out the Hebrew Scriptures according to God's will. He didn't come to change it. When he said he fulfilled it, he came to show us in full expression what it means to live a life that's founded in God's command and not in mankind, not in man. This is how we surpass the scribes and Pharisees. We live out the Torah better than they do. Not, not, adding, to it to our, not adding to it our traditions as they did and doing it, the way you, but doing it the way Yeshua did. This is really what the whole Matthew 5 is all about. It's Yeshua contrasting his correct interpretation of the Torah with the incorrect interpretation of the Pharisees and the scribes. Very powerful. Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 22. Watch. This is, this is, this is, the, this is Jesus and the disciples. And they went to Capernaum right away on Sabbath or Shabbat. Thank you for joining in. He entered the synagogue and began to teach. Who is they? Who do y'all think they are? The disciples, his own boys, they went to Capernaum and right away on Sabbath, where did you find them? In the synagogue. Verse 22, 
And they were astounded at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the Torah scholars. Amen to that. Now look at this. Yeshua and his disciples come into Capernaum, and what do they do? Right away, on the Sabbath, they go to the synagogue. This again communicates what was important to Messiah, right? Look here at Luke 4. I love this. One of my favorite verses. Luke 4, 15 and 17. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone was praising him. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been raised, as was his custom. What did he do? He went into the synagogue on Sabbath, and he got up to read. Listen to this, guys. When the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. That's a whole other message right there. I can go into that. Praise God, right? What was his custom in Sabbath? So let me say something. If Messiah wanted to do away with the Sabbath, why is he leading it by, by giving us the example? First John says what? Anyone who's going to follow Messiah must do what? Live as he lived. We do as he did. Why? He, we're disciples of Messiah. We're not disciples of the First Baptist Church, Pentecostal Church, Methodist Church, Bible Church, Catholic Church, Ever Church. Whatever church you want to name, that's not who we're disciples of. We follow Messiah. And we live as Messiah lived. Very, very powerful, right? Very, very powerful. I want you to see something very important. Yeshua does not command us to keep Sabbath, but what does he do? It's even more powerful than words. He demonstrates it. Everything that Jesus ever did was all about demonstration, wasn't it? I came to demonstrate to you. I'm going to show you what love looks like. And how did he show us that demonstration? He didn't just tell us. He got up on a cross and he died for us. He demonstrates love. He demonstrates what it means to live like the Father. And then he says to the Father in his last prayer, make them as one. As you and I are as one. He demonstrates to his apostles and disciples what it means. Jesus always brings the demonstration. Now, let's take a minute and show you another side of Yeshua and the Sabbath by looking at a better picture of Matthew 5. In action, remember Yeshua said that he did not come to abolish, but what? To bring to full expression the Torah. Matthew chapter 12. Watch this. It's so good. At that time, Yeshua went through the grain field. Most of you have read this. Most people will use this scripture to say this is where Jesus did away with the Torah, right here, or did away with, with the Sabbath keeping. This is, come on, man. I don't know where they get it, but you read for yourself and you tell me what you think. All right. And at that time, Yeshua went through the grain fields on Shabbat. His disciples became hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and eat them. Now, but when the Pharisees, oh, here we go, right, saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples have done away with the Sabbath. Is that what your translation reads? No, that's not what it says. Now look, your disciples are doing what is not permitted on the Shabbat. Now they're, they're taking a little passage out of the book of Deuteronomy, I believe, and they're twisting it completely. Now you've got to remember, man, under the Sabbath there was about uh, 56 different rules, and this is what they're referring to. They're not referring to the actual Torah. Remember Yom Shabbat, verse uh, 8. Did I read this? But when the Pharisees, yeah, go, did I read the verse 7? I think I did. Remember your Yom Shabbat to keep it holy. You are to work six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Shabbat. Oh, wait, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. I'm sorry, go back. Thank you very much. I went ahead of myself. I know. All right, I got I to gotta, I gotta, I gotta lead you up into this because it's so good. Verse 8, say, oh, don't go to, uh, there. So it says, here's the question I want to ask. Look at your disciples doing what is not permitted on the Sabbath. Now, here's the question I got to ask. And I kind of already gave you a hint, right? But what, where is it or what are they saying that they're breaking Sabbath? Where's it at? Whose law are they breaking? We know that, right? Now, let's look at Exodus. I had, to, I had to open this up, right? I get too excited. I'm sorry. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 and 11. Now, watch this. This is the, this is the command to keep Torah. I'm sorry, keep Sabbath. You ready? Remember Yom Shabbat, the Torah, to keep it holy. You are to work six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath or Shabbat to Adonai your God. In it you shall, do, you shall not do any work, not you, not your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your cattle, nor the outsiders within your gates. For in six days Adonai made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Thus Adonai blessed Yom Shabbat and made it holy. Now, in what I just read, where did the disciples break the Torah? Nowhere. Were they working? No. no. Matter of fact, this is where Jesus comes on the scene and he shows us the intent and what this really is all about. Right? So remember we talk about these things, you know, hey, when you're, when you're, uh, he, let me look for you, okay, keep focused, Mike. 
I don't want to confuse you. So where's the word not This is a problem. Again, we're seeing tradition being held up against the Lord's Sabbath. You can go back to Matthew 12 and look at it again. Yeshua corrects the Pharisees by, doing, by going into the Torah and the prophets and correcting them by what the Torah actually says, right? He says to them in verse 3, he says, but he said to them, haven't you read what David did when he became hungry and those with him? Hold it right there. First thing that Messiah does, he, he doesn't come in and go, you guys are right. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm going to be doing away with this anyways, so don't really make a big deal out of this, right? He doesn't say, oh, the Sabbath's been done away with. Hey, guys, when I die, this thing's, this thing's mute anyway. Don't even worry about it, right? He doesn't do any of that. What does he do? He goes back to the Word. And he brings out uh, what David did, circumstantial, right? This is powerful. Notice what were David's men doing at this time. You all know the story? They were in battle. They were in war. And they needed to eat to survive to continue the battle. This is why Yeshua said, watch what he says, so powerful. Many of y'all have missed the scripture where he says, man, pray that the Adonai doesn't return during Sabbath. Why is that so important? Well, you've got to go back to Maccabees and see the importance of it. So if you watch the battle of Maccabees, these guys honored the Sabbath so, so true and stayed so true to the Sabbath that they were willing to die and not fight in the middle of combat. They would rather die. Now, finally, this is where we get... Hanukkah for, from and, and about God's faithfulness, they finally come to a place in, in, in Maccabees chapter 3, I'm sorry, Maccabees 3, the book Maccabees 3, where they say, you know what? If we keep honoring the Sabbath and getting our butts basically handed to us, we all going to be dead. It's not going to matter anyways. So they decided to fight on Sabbath and defeat the enemy. It's powerful. This is what Messiah is saying. He's like, look, man, this is all about the heart. They weren't out to try to break the Torah. They were defending. They were fighting. They were in war. They were in battle. Nowhere in the Bible does it say they're not supposed to do that. Then he gets them to do another one in Matthew, I believe it's Matthew 12, 5. Or haven't you read in the Torah that on Shabbat, the priests in the temple break Sabbath, yet are innocent? Why? Because they're serving. They're serving the people. They're making sacrifices. They're working inside the temple. Right? Verse 27, then he said to them, Shabbat was made for man. This is what we get so discombobulated, right? Shabbat was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man, powerful verse, so the Son of Man is Lord even of Shabbat or the Sabbath. Now, of this verse, all right, I promise you I didn't move any out of the way. To, you can go back and study for yourself. Where in this text did you ever see Messiah change the Sabbath? But people use this passage, this whole Matthew um, 12 verse, as, that, as evidence to say, see? See what he's saying? See, he's saying, I've even heard a pastor say this, man, that Jesus is our Sabbath. No, Jesus brings us into the rest. Yeah, book of Hebrews. All right, I get that. But he's not the Sabbath. He honored the Sabbath. He worshiped the Sabbath. Or he worshiped on the Sabbath. The Sabbath, this is so powerful. What does he do? He explains it. He brings it to full expression. He shows the disciples, or the, not only the disciples, but he shows the Pharisees and the Sadducees what this really means. And what that phrase means, that he's Lord of the Sabbath, this is powerful. I believe I wrote it down in your, in your text. It means that he's the proper interpreter of the Sabbath. You know why he's the proper interpreter? Because he's God. And he created the Sabbath. And he created it for us to rest to cease from trying to prove ourselves, from cease from trying to earn our way, from cease and rest in Him. Gather together, worship with one another. Amen? Amen. This is a powerful scripture, man. Matthew 12, 9. Leaving from there, He went into the... Now, after the thought, I'm going to say, where am I at? I've got to find out. Praise God. Let's read. Where are we at? Matthew 12, 9. Thank you very much. Now, in Matthew 12, 9, it says, leaving from there, where does He go? First place He goes to is back into their synagogue. It's powerful. Something worth noting that I've heard from others and thought of myself, why would Yeshua restore the true purpose of Sabbath if he intended to get rid of it? But he's demonstrating to these scribes and these Pharisees what? What the Sabbath really was about. He never got rid of it, church. He never did away with it. Why would he, Here's another question. Let's just put our thinking caps on for a moment, right? Why would Messiah get rid of one commandment and not all, all, all the other nine? Right? Come on, man, he didn't do that. This is where it comes where we have to begin to study for ourselves. A workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I love what Roy E. Gaines says. He says, why would he restore something that he was about to do away with? That would make as much sense as remodeling a house before demolishing it. Think about it. 
Now, before we switch gears, I, 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 uh, I would not be doing any justice if we didn't look at Paul and the apostles on the Sabbath. And I've got about a couple of minutes to get this done. <laughs> they told me to talk fast this morning. I'm like, I always talk fast. Jeez. I'm almost done, I promise you. The question is, does the apostles and the disciples, do they agree with Yeshua? That's what you have to look at, right? So if Yeshua did away with this, right? Here's what's crazy. You know, for over 300 years, 300 years, the early church practiced Sabbath. Matter of fact, way beyond that, but that's, where the, that's when the headache began, right? In the Counts of Nicene is where it starts, but it ends in Counts of Laodicea. Now watch this. Acts 13, verse 42 through 44. This is so good. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging them to speak these things to them on the next Sabbath. <laughs> not the Lord's Day, not the next Sunday, but on the Sabbath. Watch this, verse 43. When the synagogue meeting broke up, many of the Jews and people and God-fearing inquirers followed Paul and Barnabas who were speaking with them and trying to persuade them to continue in the grace of God. Verse 44. The following week, so not only did we meet on this Sabbath, the next Sabbath, almost the entire city came out to hear the word of the Lord. Come on, somebody. This is God's word. Come on, man. We have checked our brains in at the door when we come into the church. And we're like, oh, I'm just going to. This is what it says. Let's listen. Acts 16, verse 13. On the Sabbath, Yom Shabbat, he, we went outside the gate of the river. Now, this is a cool story. This is Paul out on his missionary journey. And I think he was actually captive. But he's in a colony of Rome. And in Rome, guess what? There was no synagogue. There was no church. So you know what he does? Which is so cool. He goes outside the gate to a river. They were going to a place to, to pray on the Sabbath, but they couldn't find a place. We sat down and began speaking with the woman who had gathered. For most, now, this is cool. The reason why I think it's cool, that's Lydia, by the way. So if all y'all know, that, that's, that's a big testimony, man. That's a big aha. Man, she got baptized or immersed, and she gets saved right, by Paul as Paul, on the Sabbath, goes outside the city gates to pray because he's going to honor the Sabbath. Did Paul break Sabbath when he did that? Nope. Absolutely not. Why? This is the heart, guys. He's preaching the gospel. He's loving on people. He's baptizing. He's doing those things. That's not a breaking of the Sabbath. Acts 15, 21. For Moses from, this is probably one of my favorite ones. I could hang out on this one all day. For Moses from ancient generations has had in everything. This is Jimmy talking, or James. We call him Jimmy. We're close to him, right? This is, this is, this is the Apostle James. This is powerful. James says, for Moses and ancient generations have heard in every city those who proclaim him, since he is read in all the synagogues, when? Every. every Sabbath. Do you know who James is in referencing to? If you were here for the Gentile, or the, the Gentile series, there we go, all right. There's the answer. If you were here for the Galatians series, you know the answer to this, right? He's writing about the Gentiles. In the debate of what should we put on the Gentiles and what should we not put on the Gentiles. The problem with a lot of churches is they stop before they get to verse 21. And they stop at the place where, Paul, where James says, don't have, only have them do these four, four different things. right? The uh, 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 sacrifice to idols, sexual morality, uh, eat things that were choked, and I think drink blood. If some of y'all can correct me later, I think, that, I, think that's, I think those are four things, right? And that's powerful, but then he goes on to say he doesn't stop there. But a lot of teachers will stop right there and they won't go on and read the rest of it where he says, For Moses from ancient generations has had in every city those who proclaim him since he is read in the synagogues every Shabbat. He says this in a statement meaning that the Gentile believers are going to join the Jewish people in synagogue and they will hear the word. They will hear the Torah. They didn't need to be taught everything in that minute. Just give them a little bit. Let them start with these four things. It's just like when you gave your life to the Lord, right? No one said, okay, you got to do this, 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 and this, and this. They said, hey, all right, this is what you need to do. First of all, you need to get baptized. Amen? And then you need to start reading the book. I tell people, read the book of James. That's what I tell them always, or First John. Start there. Start being faithful at church. Stop sinning. That's a good idea, right? <laughs> Let's not keep doing that. Right? Kind of got us in the mess we're in right now, right? So you're, even when you're, even as a Christian, you're given just a couple of things to do and then as you grow and as you come to church, what do you do? You grow. You learn. Right? You learn, wait a minute, there's more than just coming to church. That's right. i got to pray. i got to read my Bible. There's more than just worshiping, right? i got to love people. Crazy, right? I mean, just all this stuff that, 
We don't force this stuff. You learn it a little time. This is exactly what's happening in this council of Jerusalem. Acts 17 and 2. As was his custom. Paul went to the Jewish people and for three Shabbats he debated the scriptures with them. Verse 4. And he was debating every Sabbath, every Shabbat in the synagogue trying to persuade both Jews and who else? Greeks. Guys, you can't make this stuff up. You know what I'm saying? It's all over the New Testament. All right, where am I at? Oh, my Atlanta. I'm going to make it. Praise the Lord. I can do it. I can do it. I think I can. I think I can. All right. All right, I'm going to skip on down here. Where do we got? So we got a whole, uh, I did all the, uh, there. am I in Peter? Is that where I am? Praise God. Cool. We're wrapping it up. This is good because we're almost done. All right. Whew. Now, here's what I love. Now, Peter doesn't directly say honor the Sabbath. But here's what he does do, which is so, so cool. Okay. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, Peter says something really cool. He says, for it is written, the Kedoshim, that's the holy ones, right? You shall be, for I am Kodesh. Now, we know if you come to church for any length of time, the word Kodesh simply means holy. Your translation may say, may say it something like this. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. All right? The question you have to ask a question right here. Here's a good question. Where did Peter get this from? Well, let me show you. It's found in the book of Leviticus. It's a matter of fact, it's a direct quote from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. And it says, speak to all the congregation of Ben-Azrael and tell them you shall be Kedoshim, for I don't know your God, am holy. He gives them a direct quote. But here's what's beautiful about this. How do you stay holy? How do you stay Kodeshim? Leviticus 12, or 19, verse 2, tells us. The very next verse. Each one of you is respected as mother and father and keep my Shabbat. I am Adonai, your God. Bow. Why are we moving to Sabbath? Because we're commanded to. Because we love Messiah. Because we've been brought in and we're, we're now grafted into the vine. Romans chapter 11, amen? We're grafted in. We're a part of Israel because of Messiah, because of Jesus. And because of that, we are going to obey all of his commands. Are we perfect? Nowhere in Scripture does it tell you that we're perfect. Matter of fact, it says that when we do sin. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We have an advocate, Messiah, Yeshua, right? Messiah, who is the appropriation of our sin and is quick and able to forgive us, what? All unrighteousness. Doesn't mean we're perfect, right? But we shouldn't have intention, be intentional, lawless. Amen? I want to give you one quick thing as we wrap up. I want to talk to you real quick. This is kind of like the deep theological stuff is over with, okay? We made it, all right? Made it. Almost. All right, let me finish it up with this. How do we honor the Sabbath? How do we honor the Sabbath? Number one, assemble together as a holy convocation. This is what the commandment says. The commandment doesn't say meet on any time. Now, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? You can meet on any day, right? You can worship God any day that you want. But we are commanded on the Sabbath to gather together as a holy convocation. The word convocation, don't let it scare you, simply means a holy assembly. It means you should be right where you're at as a holy assembly. That's what we're supposed to do. Number two, rest. I know that's crazy for some of y'all, isn't it? Amen, right? Take a break. Stop striving. Stop trying to prove yourself, whatever that looks like in your job. It means to stop working. Quit working. Whatever your job is, stop it. Robin, last night, just as a joke, we were on Sabbath, yesterday afternoon, and uh, we were watching some, I don't remember if it's uh, one of the, about three services that we watch, and she started talking to me about Planning Center. And if y'all don't know what Planning Center is, that's where we schedule all of our workers, that's where we do all that, right? She's sitting there talking about, well, you know, I don't see this in schedule, and I think it was, a, I think it was about Hanukkah, you know? And I'm like, whoa, 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 I said, time out. I'm off. This is my Sabbath, woman. Leave me alone. We'll talk about it at 6.30 tonight, okay? We'll talk about it when the sun goes down and Sabbath is over with, okay? Sabbath begins Friday evening. Everybody say Friday evening. Friday. At sunset, you are to honor the Father. Right? No work. From, I know some of y'all drive. It's driving you crazy already. Like no work. None. Cease from labor. Sabbath means to desist and cease. You do not work from sundown. And daddies, let me tell you something. Some of y'all need to hear this. That means your wife shouldn't have to cook for you. Oh, oh, what? Praise the Lord. I just want some of y'all over to Sabbath right there. Praise God. Okay. You prepare it. You prepare it beforehand. Dad's help. You didn't hear that part, 
They didn't hear that. They all just like, all the guys just checked out on me. Like, I don't believe this nonsense. This is crazy. <laughs> I'm going back to Sunday worship. Okay. <laughs> Cease from working or striving. Number three, very important, guys. This is where I see a lot of people miss it. Let others rest by not purchasing anything, food, gas, etc. Because remember, that it says the commandments for our servant, our male servant, our female servant, right? Now, we, unless you, I don't know something I don't know, right? That y'all got servants around here, all right? If you do, hey, I hope you're giving to the church. That's all I'm saying, okay? But listen, it says that we don't cause others to work. And so if you're going out, getting your, I know, I know I'm going to, I'm almost afraid to say what I, I have it written down. Okay? I don't want, this isn't a judgment call, okay? But if you're going around, I'm going to look up here, like Starbucks on <laughs> Sabbath, don't do it. We have a plan. Don't all right? Worry. Purchase it the day before. All right, have a plan. These addicted guys, know, like we've already worked, we found the loophole, okay? We found the loophole. We, we found the loophole. Sabbath is supposed to be a day of celebration. It's supposed to be a time of rest, right? Now, real quick, I want to make, I want to give you some, uh, y'all going to learn a phrase, and here's the phrase, the Sabbath hustle. How many of y'all have learned the Sabbath hustle yet? Nobody? I have. Y'all know the Sabbath, y'all do the Sabbath hustle? It's almost dark. It's like one hour, and you got to get some cheese. You got to get some milk, man. Things that you're tight, right? And you're running like, you're, you're sending the honey, like, you need to get to the store, and it's almost dark. You better get your tail moving. Like, go, right? <laughs> it's the Sabbath hustle, right? Learn it. Embrace it right? Because at sundown, it's done. And you're doing it not because Pastor Mike is up here preaching you to do it. You're doing it because you love Adonai. And he commands you to do it. He loves you. And he says, man, make it holy, make it special. And this is how we do it. This isn't, you don't have to do it the way Robin and I do it or your neighbors or someone else. But, and I know there's a lot of tradition out there. I know there's a lot of different things out there, right? Like, well, do I do it this way? Do I light two candles? Do I light one candle? Do I light a candle at all? Do I have to put a veil over me? Do I got to do the waving thing, right, for the candles to come? Look, a lot of that, guys, is simple tradition. It's not in Scripture. I'm going to tell you something. Make it special, though. Every week. Make it special. Maybe pull out the fine china, the better than normal paper plates, <laughs> you know? Especially if you've got an army to feed, amen? But, you, but make it special. Eat at the same time. Dad, lay hands on your wives and pray over them and bless them. Bless them. Grab your children. No, bring your children. Don't grab them. And bless them. Pray over your sons that they'll rise up as Ephraim and Manasseh. Pray over your daughter that they'll rise up like, like Ruth and Naomi. Right? Pray over them. Bless your family. Make the night special. If you have the TLV version of the Bible or even the app, there's prayers in the back of that app which are beautiful that you can use on Sabbath. If you're a single guy, make it special. Spend time with the Father before you eat. Make a very special dinner for yourself, right? Have a special meal each weekend. Read scripture together during the Sabbath, during the evening. Pray over each other. Light a candle or two. Robin and I do, this is our tradition. You guys can do it. You can steal it, okay? And I'm sure I stole it from someone because I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, right? And what we do is I light, Robin does the, the traditional um, light, the, the Shabbat light. You guys can look that up if you want to. But then I take the second candle. If you've done Sabbath with us, you've, you've seen this done before. Then I take the second candle right? And I hold it just above the flame. I don't hold it in the flame. I hold it just above the flame. And I kind of say something like this with those that are around us. If it's just me and Robin, I still do it. And that the Lord doesn't call us just to try him. You know, where you kind of come in the fire, come out of the fire, come in the fire. He calls us to stay in his presence. And if you'll take that candle and hold it just above the flame about that far, it lights by itself. It's amazing. And that's what God calls us to do to stay in his presence so that we never lose our fire. And then when we have that lighted candle, I don't hold it to myself. God never said keep the light to myself. And we pass it around the table or I pass it to Robin and my grandkids are here. We hand it to the kids. We're very careful. We don't want to burn the house down, right? But we do these things. Why? Just for our tradition. Start your own Sabbath tradition. And everyone in here probably already has something that they do that's their tradition. Whatever you do, honor it, make it special. From Friday evening to Sunday evening. Turn life off for a minute, right? Turn the world off and join with your Father because He made this day for you. He made this day for us. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Here's what I'm going to do. Dustin and I are going to come to the front. 
We're going to do a time of prayer as the, as the team is worshiping. If you need prayer, Dustin and I are going to stand right here together. And if you need prayer, come up and receive prayer. Like, we want to pray over you. Um, if you feel like it and you're someone around you, as the Lord's leading you, pray over someone next to you, right? Let's spend some, a few minutes in prayer. And if Sabbath is an issue for you, right, here's what I want you to do. Would you just talk to Daddy about it? Ask him, why is it a deal for me? Why is it an issue for me? Why do I, why do I feel awkward when I do it? Or why do I...